Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory Glory to the the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia.
A reading from the book of Exodus. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they may increase and in the event of war join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Python and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing mass tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. <clears throat> the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them to do. But they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because of Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it, placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister <coughs> said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat>
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I appeal to you, brother and sisters, by the mercy of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members are, have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Proce prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate and cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone 
that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I speak to the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Today our lectionary turns to a new book in the Hebrew Bible, the Exodus. This dramatic story of rivalry between nations and gods begins with a deceptively small and personal set of scenes featuring five unexpected heroes arrayed against the greatest power of their age. The setting is during the peak of ancient Egyptian power, both in wealth and in conquest, near the end of the second millennium BCE. The pharaohs extended their rule all the way north along the Mediterranean coast to, where, to Syria, where they fought the Hittites. And of course, they built grand palaces and tombs that awe us still today. Into this story come the descendants of that little band of nomads from Canaan, led by that Joseph and his family we heard about last week. For many generations, our narrator tells us that they had lived and prospered in the land as an honored ethnic group. But the first verse of our reading today foretells an ominous turn in fortune. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. The Pharaoh's shrewd dealings begin with simple enslavement. The Hebrews are put under forced labor to build his cities. And we hear that their lives are made bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. But this isn't enough to satisfy the Pharaoh's desires. The people continue to grow strong and so he decides that genocide is in order. This is where the first two of our unlikely heroes enter the scene. The Pharaoh calls up two women, Shifra and Pua, aka Harmony and Bel. Either Hebrew midwives or midwives to the Hebrews, these women are apparently the birth czars for the royal household which would put them in charge of quite a department with a vast harem and children in the triple digits from the first generation alone. Pharaoh now commands Harmony and Bel as an extension of his divine power. You see, midwives at the time were seen as far more than medical practitioners. Their work engaged the threshold of life itself, and they were seen as prophets who wielded power through divination over the survival or death of their patients. Thus Pharaoh, as a god on earth, sought to affect his aims through subjecting their power to his. Yet the story tells us that their allegiance was placed with a rival god. In his name, they enacted a dangerous deception in one of the original acts of civil disobedience by refusing to follow the orders to kill the male babies. When Pharaoh hears what is happening, he summons Harmony and Bel into his presence again. For what purpose have you done this thing to let the children live? The women are ready for this, and they have a response prepared that plays directly into the Pharaoh's prejudices and biases as an Egyptian man. It is thus, not like the Egyptians or the Hebrew women, like wild beasts. Before we come to them, they are delivered. 
Harmony and Bell deliver an ethnic slur that they know this elitist man will buy. These primitive, animal-like outsiders are uncontrollable and subhuman. They use a word in Hebrew translated in our reading as vigorous that is tied to the noun for wild beast or animal. Now, this may also play as a subtle jibe at their boss, for between the two, this oversexed and unrestrained stallion may be seen as more beast-like than their clients. In addition, they are counting on the pharaoh's desire to keep distant from that icky woman stuff and not get too involved in the details. And they succeed. The pharaoh's first attempt to employ mystical powers against God's people fails while God blesses the heroes who work in his power. Harmony and Bell are granted houses in the Hebrew, which have three connotations. They are granted families and homes of their own, which many harem workers could not expect to have of their own. It also implies dynasties, to which later rabbinic sources attribute the line of Kehana, the priests, and Leviha, assistance to the priests. And it may also reference their defeat of the pharaoh, a title which literally means great house. Now that pharaoh's original aims to twist the powers of midwifery under his control has failed, he moves on to a simpler plan by commanding all his people at large to throw all male children of the Hebrews into the mighty Nile that was part of the endless cycle of his cosmos. And so the second act of heroic rebellion starts with an enslaved Hebrew woman named Jacobed, who is one those the midwives have let slip. She cares for her newborn in defiance of Egyptian law, but after a few months, she despairs of keeping him secret. And so, in literal obedience, yet carefully constructed rebellion to the pharaoh's command at once, she throws the baby into the Nile, albeit in a floating basket. What she hopes from this we can't know, only that she has left the outcome up to God, which God is yet to be seen, of course. Up to the plate steps her young daughter, Miriam. She stays behind at a distance to learn what will become of her little brother. And thus it is this little girl, likely under 10 years old, who sees when the basket is discovered by an Egyptian princess come down to bathe. Now let's imagine what Miriam must have witnessed and been formed by in her young life. Her parents were slaves, forced to work under whips, staggering home from the harsh sun and heavy toil to collapse in pain every day. Yet she also would have watched her mother and the midwives working together against the unimaginably great power of divine empire and seen courage enacted in a community of subversive leaders involved in crafty resistance to oppression. As she crouches hidden among the reeds, Miriam sees the princess immediately recognize the babe as Hebrew, possibly by a darker skin tone, and openly remark on his ethnicity. Barriers such as this would have been carefully and clearly set in that culture, and Miriam would know that her own identification would be just as easily seen as well as understanding that the princess has a decision to be made on the spot. And so Miriam exchanges her own safety for the potential opportunity to save her brother. She chooses to unveil herself as one of the vulnerable, an ally with those res resisting the Pharaoh's decrees, just as God does for Israel as a whole in this book. 
she boldly walks forward and asks a question of Pharaoh's daughter, framed as if the decision of rescue has already been made. Her phrasing invites the princess to picture herself as the baby's new caregiver, while also offering a solution to the baby's crying and cleverly playing again on the assumptions of ethnic boundaries. In doing so, Miriam draws the fifth figure into the drama, either wittingly or not. Whether the royal woman is oblivious and ignorant, or a willing accomplice in resisting her father, which is a reasonable possibility in the pol politics of the time, the effect is the same. The princess becomes a collaborator in the Hebrew god's play against the Egyptian god, ensuring that this little baby is nurtured with his mother's milk and the stories of rebellion with the very treasury of the enemy. These five women are too quickly set aside as the story moves toward the male protagonist of the larger narrative. And yet, if we look closely, we can see them as setting the stage by embodying the very essence of God's salvation throughout history. The resistance here is not led by powerful men, but by women, thought to be weak and vulnerable by their society. In the face of solitary and cruel power, they employ cleverness, collaboration, and compassion. For every stroke of the Pharaoh God's rod, they and their God duck and weave and win through weakness rather than strength. For this story is not so simple as the Pharaoh has stated in the introduction. His appeal uses a line used only elsewhere of the people of Babel who build up a tower against God. After all, there are easier ways of getting rid of a troublesome ethnic group than enslaving them and ensuring their, this, their opposition to you. The real story is hidden in the translated phrase, come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Because the word here is actually singular, not plural, him. Pharaoh is pitting his power directly against the God of the Hebrews, and they'll come to direct blows later on in the story. But in the opening round, God's champions are not great warriors or magicians, but instead five clever women. In our own time, we are still far from recognizing the value of women leaders in our churches, businesses, and government. But as we reflect on these ancient stories, I hope all of us remember that God's kingdom is built on a man who is born of a woman named Miriam, aka Mary, who sought out and was sought by women as supporters and disciples and apostles, and who himself chose the route of victory through subversive weakness rather than macho strength. And let us remember to name these women as among the great heroes of our faith. The daughter of the Pharaoh, raising his adversary's ultimate champion under his very nose. And Miriam, daughter of Hakabed, prophet of Israel, co-leader of the people, and co-receiver of the Torah with her brother Moses. And also the midwives, Shifra and Pua, without whom there would be no people to tell the story. Amen. Let us join now in the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will will come come again again to judge the living living and the dead. dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us lift our voices in prayer joining with the faithful throughout the world who offer their intercessions this day, responding, Lord, hear our prayer. Give your grace to those who care for children in foster homes, sustain them with patience, and encourage them to provide a family of love and respect. Let us pray, Lord, hear our prayer. Open our eyes to behold your hand in the work of creation, that we may marvel at your intricate craftsmanship and tend the beauty that we behold. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Pour your knowledge into the minds of those who are returning to school for the next few weeks and for those attending for the first time. Still their hearts by your loving presence. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant us the grace to honor the many gifts that you have given, not coveting what our neighbor has received, but grateful for what you have entrusted to our care. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Reveal yourself in every nation and people that we may know you to be the Christ, the Messiah, the one who saves our souls from the pit of darkness and who comes carrying the lamp of charity that leads us to the divine life. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Give life to those in the tomb, opening the gates of heaven to all who desire eternal life. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us continue our prayers to God, who cares for the lowly and guards us in the midst of trouble. We pray now for those on our prayer list, including Catherine, Debbie, Carol, John, Tom, Colleen, Marion, Shirley, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Dan, Brian, Lauren, Irene, Jeff, Byron and Cece, Kevin, Raylan, Shayla, Brenda, Chris, 
Mike, Alicia, Lee, Nina, Sandy, Sam, Jeff, Hap, Kathy, Carrie, Jesse, Jennifer, Mary Frances, Amanda, and Donna. And for all who have died in communion of your church, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have, a, have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. On the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. John's in Charleston. And in our companion diocese in Columbia, we pray for the, Re the Reverend Geraldo Orozco, Medios e Communicacionis Diocesanos. We also pray for our next bishop. Almighty God, you have created each person with many and varied gifts and joined our lives together as members of the Diocese of West Virginia. Look graciously upon us as we search for our eighth bishop, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will care for your people and equip us for our ministries. Give us minds to discern your will, courage to follow where you lead, and hearts to love as you command. To the glory of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, I ask you to offer any additional prayers of intercession or thanksgiving that you might have. We pray now for students and teachers, all those returning to education, to training, that you will give safety and a good year to all. Be with us now in our anxiety, in our unknowns, in all our best efforts to do what we feel is to be best for our community and all around us. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Let us join now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and, and by, by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is time now to recognize birthdays and anniversaries in our church. For this week, we have the birthdays of Tom, Jack, Paul, Kevin, Rose, Eamon, and Joyce. Let us say the birthday prayer together. Gracious, Gracious God, God, as we rejoice in the birthdays of these your children, we pray that the year ahead will be one of blessing and peace, and that the year will bring continual joy in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love, through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. And now a few announcements. Our worship schedule will continue as it has been, with the exception of next Sunday. For our next Sunday, we will be taking a um, break from the recording of our services. So we will be um, inviting you all to uh, participate in the National Cathedral service or in our Diocesan Eucharist service. We will still have our coffee hour. We will also be taking a break from our uh, book study. This is partially to allow us to get ready for the next stage of our online worship, and that will be to move to a live stream service rather than the pre-recorded service. That will begin the following Sunday on September 6th, um, 9 a.m., which will also be available later. It will be, continue to be recorded, but it will be live this time. And then we will continue with our 10 a.m. coffee hour. Our book study will continue to be on hold um, in, as we transition from one book to a new topic, and that will be announced shortly, um, as well as the start date for that. We had a uh, successful uh, cleaning day up on the, tra the Paul Trail this last Sunday. And we will have another one tomorrow evening at um, 5.30 to 7.30 will be another uh, work day for youth and parents and anyone who wants to get involved and help with that. As you've seen in our prayers, we continue to hold um, our deacon, Al, and all the members of the bishop search team in our prayers as they search for a new leader for our state and diocese. And now, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.